Greetings comic book fans, I'm Jason and welcome to my comic book reviews for the books that were released on the third week of January. Um, as usual this week we're going to go through DC first, then I'm going to review the indie books and then I'm going to review the Marvel books I picked up this week. So without further ado, let's get into those reviews. So this week from DC we've got four books. Uh, are two weekly books and the other two books are two monthly books so we're going to kick things off as usual with our weekly books and first up we have Batman Eternal issue number 42 uh, now this continues the story we was following last week where um, the Mad Hatter was revealed to be behind all the nanobots and Red Robin, uh, Red Hood and Batgirl all got captured and converted um, into his, his his mindless slaves. So now it falls down to Harper Row to save the day, debuting as the new hero, Bluebird. What I loved in this book was the way Harper made mistakes. She's a new hero, so she's going to make mistakes. She isn't going to come in and just, like, kick ass. But what I like, and I like, because she made those mistakes, it made her more believable. Um, also, I liked how she recovered from those mistakes using her intelligence. You know, she hasn't got superior fighting skills to take people out or, you know, superior strength. So she uses her intellect and I, I really liked that. Um, the Stephanie Brown stuff in this issue I found very confusing. Um, the character that she's got captured by, I thought that character wanted her dead. Didn't she tell her dad to kill her? That The character when we saw them before. So I, I, I got a bit lost with the Stephanie Brown stuff. Free artists on this book, usually that's a problem, but I didn't feel this issue that that was a problem. I think one of the great things about the book was the colour palette, that it was similar to last issues, and all through the book it was the same, and that kind of helped unify the art that wasn't too dissimilar. Um, so yeah, and all in all, this is a nice end to this part of the story. Um, it, it kind of links up to the rest, and we have like the overarching thing of a greater villain being behind it all. But I thought this was a very satisfactory conclusion and a, a good debut for Bluebird. And I give Batman Eternal issue number 42, 4 stars out of 5. Well, moving right along now to our other weekly, the New 52, Future's End, issue number 38. And this, we're back this week to having a very much kind of anthology kind of format where each story is as its own chunk rather than intersecting. So it kicks off. We have a, a, a big fight at the beginning that we see on our cover here um, as our Batman of the future, our Batman of the modern day and our, our retired superhero Tim Drake and Plastique. They all take on this horror role, this horror kind of Joker, Batman, Bruce Wayne hybrid for the future. Um, it's really cool. There's some good moments and it was a fun kind of little battle. Uh, the Dr. Polaris Justice League fight takes an unexpected turn, which I'm really looking forward to seeing where that's going to go. It got my attention, that story did. Um, 50 Sue's story just totally lost me. Um, that part of the story was a part I wasn't really enjoying that much anyway. But then with the whole Lana Lang stuff and being like kind of like a mother to, to 50 Sue, that got my attention and that made it a bit more interesting plus the whole thing that the tease that there's more to 50 sue than we know yet that she's not a child as she appears to be so there was interesting stuff but this issue it felt like i'd missed something with their story it was like there was a page missing from last week's issue that i have not read because it's missing and you know that's how it felt like i'd missed a, an issue because the 50 sue stuff i just i was totally lost um, the Frankenstein stuff, though, as always, was the highlight of the issue. I'm just, he's my favourite character in this book, and every time he comes into the book, it's brilliant. I love the relationship with him and Amethyst. It appears like there's, there's a love bond there now, that their, their relationship is becoming love. But I like the way that, that that relationship has developed. The way it started out as respect, and then it started out as friendship, and then it's it kind of it's, it's moved through stages. And I really like that about their relationship, and um, makes it a very real kind of feeling of relationship. This issue, we get a real shocking reveal at the end in to do with Frankenstein, which I'm looking forward to see where that's going to go. Um, all in all, the only thing that thought for me really brought the book down was the art. Um, I didn't like the art on this issue. But I wouldn't go so far as to say it was bad art. It was just wasn't to my tastes. 
Uh, so I'd give Fish Futures End issue number 38 four stars out of five. So now we move on to our two monthly books. First up, we have Justice League issue 38. Um, really like that cover, and I really like this issue. This book has just suddenly got really good. Way back in the beginning of this book, I enjoyed that first arc. I know a lot of people didn't, but I did the how the team come together. But after that, when they jumped five years, I felt the story's been very up and down in quality. But this story's just been brilliant all the way through. Jeff Johns is writing some fantastic stuff. Some of the twists this issue are superb. As you know, we learn more about the Amazo virus, as we learn more about its origin and where it's come from, um, as characters kind of are pushed in different directions. It's just really, really good. You then add on top of that the art. Jason Fabak is just doing a stunning job art wise. Um, it's just a gorgeous book all the way through um, that I just absolutely love. Um, I'm just trying to find some double page spread. You can never find a double page spread when you want one, can you? Um, we get to see characters we haven't seen for a while kind of come front and center. But yeah, all in all, it's just a really, really good book. And the last page, oh boy, what a doozy. It, it got me right there ready to come back next issue. Um, I just really love this whole, this book. Right now, it's really, really good. And I'm hoping Jeff Johns can keep this going because I, I, I don't want Justice League to go back to what it was. Uh, being so inconsistent. I want it to stay like this. Um, because this, this story has just been exceptional. And I give Justice League issue 38 5 stars out of 5. So our final DC book of the week is Batman and Robin issue number 38. Um, another really nice and striking cover there for, for the book. Uh, this sees the return of Damian Wayne as Robin as he has returned from the dead and Peter Tomasi and Patrick Gleason don't miss a beat. It's like Damian never went away um, as they just ease straight back into writing him. I love the dynamic between Bruce and Damian but also the dynamic between Alfred and Damian, Alfred and Bruce. Just the whole family dynamic thing they just write so well. In anyone else's hands Damian could be a really unlikable character. But Tomasi infuses just enough humility in him that we and we get to see that at times that it makes him a character that even though at times he can be a little shit, he's still a character you root for and still a character you care about, and that's down to how well he's written. Um, this it, this issue seemed fast paced. I got through reading it very quickly, but I really like the the journey we go on with Damien as he's dealing with and processing a lot of stuff and seeing how he deals with that is really interesting. All in all, I really enjoyed this issue and I'm looking forward to seeing where Tomas is going to go with Damien. And I give Batman and Robin issue number 38, 5 stars out of 5. So those are my DC reviews and now we're going to go to the independents. So now we're on to the independent books. We've got 5 independent books to review this week. Uh, 2 from Valiant, 2 from Titan Comics and 1 from Image. So we're going to kick things off with Valiant, who I'm becoming more than a bit of a Valiant fanboy as I'm really loving everything I'm reading from Valiant at the moment. If you've not tried Valiant next, our first book up for review is a good place to start. The Valiant issue number two is a crossover event from Valiant Comics and it's a great place to start, like I said, if you're new to Valiant like me, as it really gives you a look at all the different characters and you can kind of see which characters you might like to look at a bit more. The gist of the story is we have this character called the Geomancer. And she has this re re relationship with the Earth. And she can tell what the Earth needs. And she has a protector called the Eternal Warrior. Now every so many years this great darkness comes. And if it can kill um, the Geomancer then we go through a dark ages. But if the Eternal Warrior can keep the Geomancer alive then obviously good things are going to happen. Three times this evil has come for the Geomancer. Three times Eternal Warrior has failed to protect the Geomancer. Fourth time, this isn't going to happen. And and the Eternal Warrior is calling in everybody from the Valiant Universe of Heroes to come forth and help him to protect the Geomancer from this great evil. This issue, we see the evil come face to face with the Geomancer. 
And what I really liked is that the Evo doesn't have a distinctive look or feel. It kind of takes something that, what, that the Geomancer fears. So in the case of this issue, it takes this, this childhood story that scared the Geomancer and it, it becomes an image from this story. This leads to some really great artwork as the art is kind of split between between the present and what's going on and then with this story but story stuff uh, here that kind of shows you what where, where in her mind it's plucking this uh, this image that it will become and so when he turns up as this creature from uh, the fairy story that she heard fairy tale as she heard as as a child she um he already has a, an advantage over her because she fears, because psychologically she fears this. Um, the story advances really well, pushing forward. It doesn't waste a panel as the story just pushes forward as uh, as one by one the heroes of the Valiant Universe try to protect uh, the Geomancer from this, this great evil. Um, I really enjoyed the book. The last page is great. It really gets you excited for the next issue. It just was an absolute joy to read. Um, as well, the feel of the book, it's a cardboard cover and you like you open it up and it's got like book two and it makes it feel like it's special. It makes it feel. And then you open it up and you have that opening page there that like kind of lets you know all the different characters that are in the book and who they are. Uh, with then in the back, you get this lovely kind of commentary um, as they go through how they put the book together just an absolute treat all the way round if you're new to Valiant please try this out because it is excellent you won't regret it and I give the Valiant issue number two five stars out of five so moving right along now to another book from Valiant, Valiant sorry it is Ivor Time Walker issue number one uh, this was an, another great number one from Valiant I went into this looking forward to it, but also a bit nervous. I didn't want it to be a blatant rip-off of Doctor Who. But what this book does, while it certainly has vibes of Doctor Who, it also has enough originality to kind of lead its own path as well, which I liked. Um, there's a great twist at the end. We're kind of introduced into this character, Ivor Time Walker. And we get to know him and he saves this woman and we kind of, as the story is going on, we get to learn about him and how he can travel through time. And then at the end, we're given this reveal that kind of makes you question characters in the book and whether they're good or bad. So I'm really interested to see where this is going to go. Um, love the cameos from other Valiant characters throughout time. That was really cool as well. This book has a lot of great potential and I'm really looking forward to seeing where it goes next. And I give issue one of Ivor Time Walker, five stars out of five. So moving right along now to Image. And from Image we have The Autumn Land, Tooth and Claw, issue number three. Uh, apparently in the back they were saying that Tooth and Claw will eventually get wiped from the title and it will just be The Autumn Land at some point in the future. So this issue we are introduced to this new character on the cover. Um, Goodfoot and Goodfoot uh, is a bit of a con woman and uh, bad things are going to follow but she's certainly uh, taken some people in in this issue but she's definitely a scoundrel um, there's a real leadership struggle here as, as different people have idea, different ideas about what's to happen we get to find out who the human is He's, her name is Stephen T. Learoyd and he Stevens, uh, we still don't know much about his past and where he's come from, but this issue we get to see that he may be the hero that these people need. Um, I'm really loving this story. It's a real unique feel. You've you've got so many different elements kind of combined here, uh, but it just makes a really unique and unusual book that has just been an absolute joy. And I give Autumn Autumn Lands. Oh God, I can't get my words out. Autumn Lands, Truth and Claw, issue number three. Five stars out of five. So now we move on to Titan Comics and we have Doctor Who, New Adventures for the 11th Doctor, issue number seven. Uh, this was the first issue since Titan started doing the books where I was really disappointed with the issue and didn't enjoy it so much. Um, I felt the art was a mixed bag. While there were some pages that looked spectacular, there were other pages that looked rough. 
Um, I felt like the companions for the first time this issue got on my nerves. Uh, Jones and Ark, I just could have thrown them out of an airlock and I wouldn't have missed them. And the problem when, when you have the companions get on your nerves is you're trying to build this sense of peril that the Doctor's got to save them. But if you don't care about those characters or want to see them characters die so they're not in the book no more, it, it makes that whole sense of peril kind of fall flat and the things you should be caring about fall flat. Um, on the plus side, I really like what's going on with Alice. Like the whole story starts with her being dropped off on Earth as she has things to do before travelling again with the Doctor. So I liked that and, and like and that with her story we kind of go back to issue one and pick up a plot point we left there. So I'm really interested to see where that's going to go. And the reveal at the end again is, is like really freaky. Like, well okay, what's going on here? Um, I also like the idea of the aliens we meet this well, this issue. These two alien races that kind of tore the universe fighting each other. Um, I really like that. I thought that was a, a clever idea. Um, much like the art, this whole issue is a mixed bag. So I'd give Doctor Who, 11th Doctor, issue number 7, 3 stars out of 5. So our final review this week for The Independence from Thailand Comics is Doctor Who. 12th Doctor Adventures, issue number 4. This continues the story we started last issue, um, which is really good and I really enjoyed. Uh, the art and colour in this issue I really liked. Um, I also liked the attention to detail and how each kind of section of the story has its own colour palette. And I like, like, we've got that, that one scene down here with the Doctor. Where, you, where the Doctor's like, you can just get the eyes, which is brilliant. Uh, but yeah, like I say, the book is just beautifully coloured and drawn, so I liked that. Uh, we get more on the character of Rani, and she's a very interesting character, and I liked her backstory. That that was really good. Uh, the characterizations of Do the Doctor and Clara were spot on, uh, and, and everything felt authentic that came from them. Um, and I also like the villains in this. Uh, the main villain is Carly, but we got, got this kind of underling as well who's doing a bidding. And, and both of them characters were despicable enough that I really liked it. And the cliffhanger at the end, oh boy, I'm looking forward to seeing how that's going to turn out. But there, this was another really strong issue. And I'd give Doctor Who issue 12th Doctor, issue number 4, 5 stars out of 5. So there we go, that's our independent reviews. Now for the final part of the video, we're going to review the books from Marvel. So for the final part of this video, we're down now to the Marvel reviews. Ten books from Marvel this week. Uh, as much as I complain about Marvel and about how I don't like certain business practices that they do, um, and I don't think they give the fans a real a bargain for money, uh, or value for money rather um, I it's still the biggest part of my pull list every week you know so um, hmm. yeah so you know really it's uh, it that's the problem right there as much as I complain I'm still buying all their books and while we still do that Marvel are never gonna change because they're making the dollars anywho you didn't hear watch this video to hear me rant. You want to hear comic book reviews, don't you? So we're going to get into these reviews. First up, we have Guardians of the Galaxy, issue number 23. And I was not a fan of the art this issue. I did like the new design for Venom. We get later in the issue. Uh, where is it? Yeah. I did like the design for Venom. Um, and I thought that was cool. Um, even though it does remind me, uh, at least facially, of uh, the robot from that new, that new film they've brought out um, and I did like the art when they're talking to it I thought that was good but the rest of the issue before that um, and also this scene I think is beautifully drawn as well you know I wrote down I didn't like the art but as I'm going through this book I quite like it you know um, I think the bits I didn't like were more the bits between the, the, the different characters, like these bits, those were the bits that I didn't like. Um, where was we? Oh yeah. The dialogue in this issue seems off, which Brian Michael Bendis, the writer of the book, his usual strong point is dialogue. And this issue, I don't know, the characters just didn't see themselves. And just, it seemed like somebody totally different was writing it because it, that just, it wasn't good at all. Um, 
I like the planet when we got there. It took us a long time to get to this planet. But I liked the planet when we got there and the explanation. And I, clearly a lot of thought had gone into this. And I liked the explanation. And I liked the whole reveal of what the planet was and the symbionts and everything. That was really cool. It wasn't what we was expecting. But sometimes it's nice to get something you're not expecting. Um, I mentioned already I really like the new Venom design. I think that looks really cool. Um, all in all, this issue I felt it was a nice conclusion to the story. It at least ended stronger than it's been for the most part of the story and it was a satisfactory conclusion but it's still not reaching great heights, it's still got a lot of problems and if you Guardians of the Galaxy issue number 23, 3 stars out of 5 and as a kind of epilogue onto my review I'm going to put, do you have epilogues in reviews? I don't know, is that just stories? I don't know, but kind of like a little note on the review I'm going to put that I've dropped this book now, uh, I've for the, like, the last two story arcs I've not enjoyed and I think I'd be more than patient and with Black Vortex coming up as well where most of the books that tie into that I'm not getting so I thought this is the best time to jump out so I've, so I've decided to drop that one next up we have Rocket Raccoon issue number 7 and this was another really good story I'm glad we've got the sto the books, the story that kind of carries on issue to issue back rather than the standalones. Um, I like that better. Uh, I just find personally, when you have a story that's a standalone, it makes it easier to drop that book. If you, every issue you know it's a standalone story, you know, when you need to save a bit of money, that's going to be the first book you look at. Um, whereas I, where, when the story carries on, I kind of want to see what happens next, so I, I'll keep getting it. Uh, but that's just a personal thing for me. Um, I like the art, this issue, uh, the art is done by Philippe Andrade, and I'm, I'm sure, isn't this the dude who did Captain Marvel uh, back, uh, back a while ago now, with Kelly Sue DeConnick, and it was totally different art, it was like really abstract, and I, I remember the first issue, I hated it, but by the second issue I'd got used to it, and I really began to enjoy his art, uh, but I'm sure it's that one, but his art is totally different, it's toned down a lot this issue, um, but it helps that he's not drawing human beings and he's, he's more dealing with, with, with like aliens and stuff. So that probably helps the art look not too bad. But I like the art this issue. Um, I also love how Scotty Young writes Rocket Raccoon. Um, he's a character who's got a lot of bravado, a lot of, you know, comedy. But there's another side to Rocket and, and Scotty Young writes him as a well-rounded character and you see these things sometimes, like how much he cares about Groot and, and stuff. You So you get to see that other side of Rocket and it makes you feel not just like a cartoon character but more of a well-rounded kind of character. Um, all in all, yeah, I enjoyed this one uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing where we're going to go next because things look like they're going to be tough for Rocket and I give issue 7 of Rocket Raccoon. Five stars out of five. So moving on now, we have Fantastic Four, issue number 642. Um, for some reason, because the book's finishing, Marvel have decided we're going to go back to the original numbering. Which I hate because it kind of messes up how you'd have the books numbered in your like little box uh, when they do pull shit like this. So yeah. Um, and I think in this case it might work out, but yeah, usually that can mess up your numbering system, so yeah, I don't like that at all. Anywho, um, I like the villain we got here, and I like that we learn a lot more about his plan, this issue. Not what he what he's done before, but what he's planning to do moving forward, and I really like that. That was really good. I love this story, develop, how it's developing, and how it's bringing in other people, and there's so much coming in from the, the Fantastic Four's past. Um, it's a real love letter to the book, and James Robinson's just managing it all really nice. Um, Bentley, this issue is one of my favourite characters. He really steps up this issue, and that was really cool to see. It's sad it's finishing, but it looked like it's definitely going to go out with a nuclear bang, and I give Fantastic Four issue 642, five stars out of five. Um, speaking of books finishing, next up we have all new X Factor, issue number 20. This is the final issue of the series. Um, it's a good conclusion to the story. It answers a lot of the questions we had. However, the downside is it, it feels very open-ended um, and, and, and like that there's a lot of story left to tell. Um, so that that was only the one thing because it can could be like, 
you kind of think, well, after Secret Wars, are we going to get this book relaunched again? I don't know. Um, there's a real shocking reveal with Arison Snow. We knew where he'd come from a different time, but when we find out where, oh boy, is it a humdinger. And it ties into another character, and that's all really cool to see that character show up here. And, yeah, I loved all of that. That was really cool. And uh, Though, again, we get to learn the whole plan that Harrison Snow has planned out. And it's kind of like, we're not going to see that plan get brought to fruition now. So, that, that was disappointing. Um, I also like the conclusion to Danger and Warlock's story as they finally get together. And kind of the journey we get there to and where this could push things. Again, we're not going to see where this is going to push things now and how this is going to affect Danger. But you feel you've got some closure with it in a way that it got to the point where you were hoping it would get to. But then at the same time, we're not going to see where they go from here. So it was a very strange final issue in that. While it, it did answer a lot of the big questions, it didn't kind of close the story, if you will. Um, sad to see it go. Uh, but yeah you know it's gone and i give up the final issue of all new x factor issue number 20 four stars out of five moving along now to magneto issue number 14 and i'm just loving this book colin bunn is doing such a great great job on the book this issue once again i love the art and color um it's it, sometimes you do not need lots of color little bit sparingly can be just effective as like rainbows um i also like the how they color and and the flashbacks so that they feel different to to the rest of the book and that's really cool and you kind of know where you are in the story um, I love Colin, Bo Colin Bunn's usage of the past to kind of push the story in the present forward. That's a really great device that he uses really good. And the b interesting was very... I'm sorry, the interesting... The conclusion, sorry, was very interesting. I I didn't see that coming, and I'm very interested in where this is going to go. This, as I keep saying, was my surprise here of 2014, and it looks like it's going to be just as good this year as well and i give magneto issue number 14 five stars out of five so now we enter the spider-verse portion of the review and first up we have part five spider-verse part five which is amazing spider-man issue number 13 this was just an amazing book i really loved it Giuseppe Camoncoli's art is just magnificent all the way through, so consistent, so great. Uh, I just loved it all the way through. Um, he does an exceptional job art-wise on the book, and I just absolutely love in that. Um, it proves once again why he's my favourite spider artist. This book is different from other Marvel books because there's a real sense of peril. With the other Marvel books, you know certain characters aren't going to die. And majority of the characters in the book are safe. And the more sense of peril is how are they going to get out of this rather than will they live or will they die. With this book, because you've got so many different Spider-Men, you're like, well, which of these Spider-Men are going to live and which one of these are going to get killed? Um, and which ones are going to return to their time and which ones are going to end up somewhere different. So you've got all these questions. Then you've got this big family of inheritors. So not everybody on that family is going to make it out alive. You've got to presume. So who's going to live, who's going to die. And I think more than any other book, this real has a real sense of peril. Um, more like The Walking Dead rather than any other Marvel book. You know, a lot of Marvel books, they don't have that kind of thing. This does. Um, so I'm really enjoying that. Um, again, the, the twists come in here, I'm not going to spoil. Uh, some really great twists and turns in the tale. Um, it does slightly spoil, if you read uh, Scarlet Spiders after this, it'll spoil the conclusion of that. You really need to read Scarlet Spiders before. Um, but yeah, I'm just loving where this story's going. Um, the last page, again, they do a great job of a real badass scene where you're like, yeah, I'm ready for issue 14 now. Uh, this was just great. I enjoyed it from cover to cover um, and they're doing a great job as well the way that you got the main story just running through Amazing Spider-Man and you could just read the main story and you wouldn't lose nothing but then there's all these other great stories if you are into it and want a bit more depth so I like how they've done that. 
so yeah, issue 13 of Amazing Spider-Man, I make my pick of the week. So now we move on to Scarlet Spiders, issue number 3. This should be read before that that that, that issue of Amazing Spider-Man. Even though the guide in the back says this read this after, don't. This has the conclusion of this story and you, it will get spoiled if you read Amazing before you read this. So yeah, read this before Amazing. I hope that was clear. It sounded as clear as mud to me, so I'm hoping it's clearer than it sounds to me. Um, again, this book has a great mix of characters. I really like the three spiders they've put together in this book and they make a great team. And they're just different enough to kind of bring something, each bring something different. So that was good. Um, I liked how the book ended in that while the story carries on, you do feel you've got closure to this story. Unlike, with, like I mentioned with X Factor, this you get good closure. You feel like you've had a complete story, but there's still other bits that are going to go on. But you feel at least that if you only read these three issues, you'd have got a complete story that would have satisfied you. The art, once again, is beautiful, and the shocking conclusion was slightly boiled in reading the other one first, but if you could stay away from that one first, there is a real shock at the end that, that was interesting. Um, and also, what happens in this book is going to have a big effect on what's happening in the main Spider-Verse story, so that's good as well, that it feels important. Uh, so I give issue 3 of Scarlet Spiders 5 stars out of 5. So, moving right along, we have Spider-Woman, uh, issue number 3. Again, yes, the art. It's Greg Land, so it's always going to be controversial. I still find it hilarious. You bring a feel in our lead book, which you would imagine. The core audience you're aiming for with a female book is going to be a female audience. So you take on a controversial artist like Greg Land, and you put him in charge of a book that's aimed at the female audience, I just think that is so hilarious. You can't make that kind of stuff up. Uh, people complain about DC doing some boneheaded things, but come on, that, I got, that has got to be almost anything DC do, uh, because that is just so ridiculous. But anywho, to be fair to Greg Lang this issue, I think he is improving. The facial expressions, at least in this issue, everybody wasn't smiling. They, they were reacting to stuff, which is better, which is showing he's improving, which is good. Um, there's still problems with the art, the female characters do look the same and if they weren't in different outfits it would have been difficult, but at least he's showing improvements, so you know, give the dude props where, he, where you can. Um, also I still think there's major problems with starting a series with an event tie-in because you don't really give the characters enough time to find out who that character is. Um, and this issue does suffer from that, though it is better than previous issues, as we do get a little bit more in the head of, of Spider-Woman. It also does act as a bit of a showcase to Silk and Spider-Gwen as well, which wasn't a bad thing because they're both good characters. Um, it did feel this issue, we've seen most of the story, um, because it seemed like it had happened in other books, so it was kind of like a deja vu, kind of, I've read this already feel, reading it. Um, I think... This book, for me, there was good stuff, there was bad stuff, so I'm going to give Spider-Woman issue number 3, 3 stars out of 5. So our final Spider-Verse book this week, our fourth one, is Spider-Verse Team Up issue number 3. Unfortunately, by the time I got to this book, I was Spider-Versed out, and the, I just, maybe I should have spread them out between my other books, If and really, in hindsight, I wish I had done that. Because I think I might have read this one and felt totally different about it. But having it been the first Spider-Verse book I'd read um, in a row, it was like, yeah, I've kind of had enough of Spider-Verse for this week. Um, so it will affect my review, unfortunately. Um, I kind of thought the idea of the first story was a nice idea. As Spider-Man has sent this group of spiders off on this mission to recruit Khan, the rogue inheritor, into their cause. And I like that they kind of tried to talk with him and reason with him rather than fight him. I thought that was a nice twist, but it just... A lot of the issue kind of feels superfluous. Like, we didn't need a whole issue, a whole book to kind of do that. You could have done that in one scene in the main main book. So it felt unnecessary. The follow-up story as well feels totally unnecessary. I like the art for the second day, second story with Mayday Parker. 
I, I thought the art for that second story was good. The art for the first story was dreadful. Um, but all in all, yeah, um, it was it was one I think you can definitely miss. And I give Spider Verse Team up, up issue number three two stars out of five. So we're going to close the review, hopefully with a bit of positivity, as we get into Black Widow issue number fourteen. Continues the whole chaos story uh, where Black Widow after they went after her lawyer and good friend Isaac. Is it? I keep forgetting his name. Is it Isaac or Isaiah? Isaiah. Um, I'm sure it's Isaac. It just says uh, shot her attorney. You can never find a name when you need it. And again, now I'm looking in the back of the book and like the one scene with him. There, oh, here it is, Isaiah. It is Isaiah. So, yeah, Isaiah got shot. So now Black Widow is going after Chaos by going after their money men. And this is you see, they're trying to go after them to try and fight, get closer to Chaos. We learn why they seem to be everywhere. We get that and why they seem to be see everything in this issue. And that was really interesting. There's a great scene between Maria Hill and Isaiah who's still in the hospital. I really like that scene as well. The building up um, Black Widow to like a real five star badassery uh, going on in this issue. They're really building her character up as this super badass um, that I really like. But then it just makes the villains even greater than when they can take her down because she's been such a badass. Uh, it's really great. I'm really lo loving seeing this whole mystery with chaos unfold that we've kind of been following from issue number one. The art remains very unique to this book, the way it's kind of got a watercolour effect to it. And Phil Nolto is just drawing some beautiful stuff. And I'd give Black Widow issue number 14, 5 stars out of 5. So those are my reviews for this week. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank you very much for watching. If you like the video, please give me those beautiful thumbs up. Let me know you like what I'm doing. I will be back next week. Next Wednesday, I will have a haul video up. And hopefully the early part of next week, I'll have the review for this week's books up. And hopefully after the, then next week, we can kind of get back on track. Uh, but anywho, that's me done for another week. I want to thank you once again for, for watching my video. I've been Jason. These have been my comic book reviews. Bye for now.